And tonight we have three wonderful uh, sources of knowledge uh, from New York City and beyond that will participate in the launch of this very important book. Need I introduce Nick to you, but Nicholas Freudenberg is a distinguished professor of public health at CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. Throughout his more than 40 years at CUNY, Nick has demonstrated his deep commitment to public health scholarship, community service, and advocacy. Uh, much of his work has impacted on policies, uh, forward-thinking policies in New York and beyond. He is recognized for his expertise in many domains, but certainly the area of food and food policy is amongst them. He has helped to create and lead five centers and institutes at CUNY, has worked with community organizations, youth organizations, faith-based organizations, and city agencies to develop, implement, and evaluate programs and policies with high impact on underserved communities and individuals. He has focused his career on improving the disparities that exist and reducing the health inequities that we experience even today uh, in our country. Uh, he is the author of several books and more than 150 articles in the peer-reviewed literature. He is the founding director of our school's doctoral program uh, and uh, uh, the doctorate in public health program where he continues to teach and supervise students. He also leads the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute, as well as the Healthy CUNY program that focuses on issues, priority issues of health amongst the quarter of a million students university wide. Uh, his work, uh, his new book at what cost modern capitalism and the future of health exemplifies our school's commitment to understanding the social determinants of health so pu public health professionals can take meaningful action to improve health. Thank you, Nick, for allowing us this very important opportunity this afternoon. And I am really thrilled uh, to, to be at the launch of your second book since I've arrived here. I'm also delighted uh, to introduce Dr. Marion Nessel. And Marion really is a member of our family. I don't care what university she's in, but Marion is truly part of our community uh, of advocates and uh, public health professionals and academics. We hold her very dear to our heart. Uh, she is the Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies and Public Health Emerita at NYU. In the department, she chaired from 1988 till 2003, and from which she retired in September of 2017. Her research and writing examine scientific and socioeconomic influences on food choice and its consequences, emphasizing the, rule, the role of food industry and marketing of foods. Her widely cited and best-selling books include Food Politics, How the Food Industry Influences Nutrition and Health. Let's ask Marion what you need to know about the politics of food, nutrition, and health. And Eat, Drink, Vote, an Illustrated Guide to Food Politics. It's a pleasure to have America's leading nutritionist on our program today. She has been an example to us all about firm, quiet, effective, and persistent advocacy. Welcome, Marion, to your second home. Uh, with us also tonight is a very, very dear friend and colleague, Dr. Mary Bassett, who is the director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University, as well as the FXB Professor of the Practice of Health and Human Rights at Harvard School of Public Health. With more than 30 years of experience in public health, Dr. Mary Travis Bassett has dedicated her career to advancing health equity, 
Prior to her directorship at the FXB Center, Dr. Bassett served her four years as Commissioner of Health for New York City. During that time, we worked side by side collaboratively with Mary and learned the true value of having a professional of her caliber leading an important department in New York. As commissioner, she worked to ensure that every New York City neighborhood supported the health of its residents with the goal of closing gaps in population health across the city. She is a prolific scholar, a researcher who has documented the impact of systemic racism on health and a longtime friend of CUNY School of Public Health. Need I say, Mary is a distinguished scholar at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. I am truly thrilled to have the three of you tonight and cannot wait uh, to be enriched by your personal experiences and your collective genius. Having said that, I relinquish leadership of this conversation to my very dear friend, Nick, and he will give an overview of this new book and why he wrote it. Nick, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Ayman. And I'm so honored to be able to speak to so many of my colleagues, friends, and family members, and especially pleased to welcome those of you from other countries, including Brazil, South Africa, the United Kingdom, Australia, and others. You know, for a variety of complicated reasons, I never had a bar mitzvah, but this seems like a wonderful remedial event to bring together uh, so many people from so many parts of my life. And uh, I will be reading from uh, my version of the Torah to uh, move this event along. My work for this book has depended on your scholarship, practice, and activism. And I thank all of you here for your insights and your inspiration. The years I took to research and write this book turned out to be a stellar time for apocalypse watchers. These are some we've watched together. Most obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has now infected almost 120 million people and killed more than 2.6 million around the world and more than 530,000 here in the United States. In this country, the pandemic led 30 million people to lose their jobs, at least 4 million seemingly permanently, and widened already unacceptably high racial, ethnic, health inequities. The world's unfolding climate emergency has imposed its own burden of disease. In 2020, massive fires, often aggravated by heat waves and droughts, burned forests and houses in California, Washington, Oregon, Nevada, Colorado, as well as Indonesia, Brazil, and Australia. A record-breaking 30 tropical storms or hurricanes hit states on the Gulf and Atlantic coast and in the Caribbean killing almost 400 people, destroying homes and communities, and imposing costs of more than $33 billion. Climate change has disrupted agricultural production, increased food insecurity, and led to higher food prices. It has caused deaths from heat waves among the urban poor, especially older people, and the production process that trigger climate change have also increased exposure to pollution for hundreds of millions of people around the world. Deaths of despair, the term Princeton University economists Ann Case and Angus Deaton used to describe the rising number of deaths and increasing mortality rates among certain sectors of the white working class contributed to a tripling of the rate of deaths of adults without a high school degree in the last three decades. Deaths of despair are closely connected with use of opioid and other drugs, alcohol, firearms, and to the working conditions and expectations of the less educated. While deaths of white working class adults increased, rates of premature deaths and illnesses for Blacks, Latinx, and American Indians have remained higher than whites throughout our nation's history. The enduring legacy of the systemic racism that characterizes the US economy and our history through recent and current race-based practices and policies in healthcare, employment, food, transportation, and education. Blacks are exposed to more dangerous living and working conditions, get fewer and worse services, and encounter racism 
in their daily lives, each contributing to higher burdens of disease. Unlike COVID, not all apocalypses play out at video game speed. Slow motion apocalypses, like the rising burden of chronic or non-communicable diseases, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, have imposed a growing burden on health here in New York and also throughout the world. Diet-related diseases are now the leading cause of premature death and preventable illnesses, an impact worsened by the role of diet in coronavirus infection. Chronic diseases are also a leading cause of the persistent gaps in health between whites and people of color. The rise of low wage weight labor in recent decades has precipitated its own public health burdens. Lax enforcement of workplace health and safety standards, longer working hours and more shift work, the rise of the gig economy, the challenges of balancing work and family life, all have jeopardized the well being of the 53 million. American workers with low wages. And finally, the dramatic rise in income and wealth inequality has contributed to these public health disasters and deepened the terrible legacy of racism. I wrote at what cost to understand the common origins of these recent apocalypses, driven by the credo of the social epidemiologists that our job is to find the cause of the causes I wanted to understand the fundamental causes of our most urgent public health problems to see if we could do something differently so that there would be fewer future crises. I hope to learn what those wanting a healthier and more just world could do to ensure that our children and grandchildren can inherit a world that sustains human and planetary health. In retrospect, the book is a field guide for apocalypse watchers to help us identify the common drivers of this cascade of public health crises so we can take action to interrupt them. In the book, I make the case that modern capitalism, defined as a dominant global political and economic system that emerged after the 1970s, is the fundamental cause of today's apocalypses. At What Cost describes how key features of 21st century capitalism, exacerbated by the 2008 Great Recession, contribute to our health crises. Corporate managed globalization spreads viruses, unhealthy products, and desperate migrants around the world. Financialization leads businesses to reduce wages and benefits, cut corners in product safety, skimp on pollution controls, and understaff nursing homes to maximize profits and ensure high annual returns to investors. Corporate control of science and technology leads to new discoveries in pharmaceuticals, food, communications, and transportation. But too often these innovations are used to maximize profits at the expense of human health. Everywhere, capitalism depends on and worsens the systemic racism and sexism that stratifies our nation and world. In the book, I make another argument. Some scholars have examined the political economy of modern capitalism to trace its underlying dynamics. I want to show as well how these changes affect people's day-to-day -day lives. I describe how changes in capitalism have undermined our quest for what I call the six pillars of health, food, education, healthcare, work, transportation, and social connections. I focus on people's day-to-day -day lives, their lived experiences for two reasons. First, as professionals, we help people when we can connect with their actual day-to-day -day concerns, not when we impose our views. Second, as political activists, we learn from the women's movement that when individuals see the personal as political and the political as personal, they can become the actors who change their world rather than only the victims of an oppressive system. In At What Cost, I examine how the tens of millions of people suffering from diet-related diseases struggle to find food they can afford, enjoy, and that will not further worsen their health. I describe parents who search for affordable and safe childcare for their children so that they can work to earn a living. 
and college students and graduates who fear they may never emerge from the debt they incur to pay for their education. I write about cancer patients who face bankruptcy because of paying for their medications and oncologists driven out of community practices to join the new healthcare networks sponsored by private equity funds that fire practitioners who fail to bring in sufficient revenues. I look at the lives of those 53 million American low wage workers whose median hourly wage is $10.22 and whose annual incomes are about 18,000 a year. The struggle for decent wages, benefits, and safe working conditions, and the right to organize have been steadily eroded after the last two decades, contributing to widening gaps in health, income, and wealth. And as we know, these low wage workers are more likely to be Black, Latinx, women, or immigrants than better paid workers. I consider the growing number of Americans who live in transportation deserts, victims of transportation apartheid, where some people have affordable mobility and others do not, but where all of us breathe the exhaust of cars that make the automobile industry prosper, but also pollute our air and worsen carbon emissions. Finally, I write about some of the ways that big tech has created products that threaten our privacy, undermine our dignity, make our personal information a commodity that they sell to advertisers and who profit from polarizing the nation and promoting false, hateful, but clickable messages. Most Americans encounter these experiences at some point in our lives. These threats to well-being are not the result of a society that does not know how to solve these problems or lacks resources to create healthy alternatives. No, they're the result of a political and economic system in which the most powerful organizations in the world today, transnational global corporations and the organizations they're allied with, profit from selling unhealthy food, imposing debt on college students, making essential medicines unaffordable, lowering wages, destroying public transportation, and making our personal data into a marketable commodity. It is time to account for the costs of leaving this system unchallenged. However, an accounting of the costs of 21st century capitalism demands an addition that we consider the alternatives. But the dominant narrative in this society, a narrative written by those who benefit from the status quo and who control mainstream channels of communication, is that our capitalist system is the best and most efficient way for organizing our world. Even if recent apocalypses make it hard to maintain that this system has no flaws, its defenders claim that any other possible system is bound to do worse. And so we should make the most of the world we have. But here, my dear readers, is where I get optimistic. Increasingly, the narrative that there is no alternative to modern capitalism as now constructed is under question. How can it be possible that as millions of people get sick or die from the pandemic, as the climate crisis worsens, as longevity declines in the United States, as so many people encounter increasing hardship in their daily lives, that we are living in the best of all worlds? And public opinion polls show wider skepticism. A Harvard poll of a national sample of 18 to 29 year olds found that 51% do not support capitalism. And perhaps more significant for this moment, large majorities of Americans favor universal health care, expanded free childcare, free community college, a higher minimum wage, and stronger public health and environmental protection. The support for a healthier, more just, more sustainable world is there. The dissatisfaction with the status quo is high, but what is missing are coherent, practical, viable alternatives, and the realistic pathways to get from where we are to a better place. And this is where public health professionals and activists can contribute. Not only, in my view, is another world possible in theory, but in practice around the world, tens of millions of people are striving every day to make that world better now. 
These include the millions of young people fighting climate change, those insisting that black lives matter, those organizing Amazon workers, farm workers, fast food workers, and food insecure college students, the church and other faith-based groups urging disinvestment in the fossil fuel, firearms, and tobacco industries, the worker cooperatives creating new forms of ownership, and the black farmers reclaiming their land. In fact, every problem facing our country, somewhere people are organizing, educating, and mobilizing to solve that problem. But what's holding us back from having a bigger impact is the isolated nature of these efforts, the sectarian rivalries between different movements, and the lack of alternative political and economic rules that would enable us to live happier, healthier, and more equitable lives. The solution to this shortfall is not gonna come from some philosopher writing in an ivory tower or garret. Rather, it will come when all of us begin the arduous task of creating a body of evidence of what works and what does not work to change this political and economic system that so burdens our lives. It will come when together we apply this evidence to the daily struggles for better living conditions. In the world of public health and health sciences, we valorize evidence-based practice, health knowledge that comes from rigorous scientific studies, ideally randomized trials. And of course, these have their place. But in the practical world of politics and social determinants of health, randomized trials are not going to solve our most urgent crises. Instead, what we need is practice-based evidence. We need syntheses of the knowledge that comes from all the efforts to change our world, to change capitalism. Such evidence can help us to identify the practical steps that will enable more of us all to benefit from the incredible wealth and the powerful science and technology that humanity has accumulated, but is now controlled by the few. I wanna close by suggesting how we can nurture the alternatives to the increasingly toxic 21st century capitalism that has spawned one public health crisis after another. First, we need evidence-based vision. What would a food system that supports human health and environmental sustainability rather than corporate profits look like? What are the specific pathways that will move us from a diet in which more than half our calories here in the United States come from ultra processed foods that make corporations rich and their consumers sick? How can we transform a food system that now subsidizes cheap, unhealthy food by paying its workers subminimum wages? All around us are alternatives, but as researchers, we need to do a better job of documenting what works to overcome the opposition will inevitably face and how to bring innovation to scale. In addition, in public health, we need to start using the word capitalism. Some of the reasons for this reluctance are obvious. Researchers and health officials fear that use of the C word will brand us as relics caught up in the conflicts of another century or immature rebels, too unsophisticated to avoid rhetorical excesses. For some, memories of the anti-communist scares make us fear that use of the words could make us targets for career damaging reprisals. Leading scientific paradigms from the reductionist biomedical models to the behavioral focus of public health practice further discourage the use of complex terms like capitalism. But this reluctance to use the word or concept of capitalism to investigate global patterns of health and disease and identify more effective approaches for preventing the global health crises of the last few decades has a cost. It ignores growing evidence that the system of capitalism itself contributes to the world's health problems. Ignoring the system that has led to these declines in health because we are unwilling to use the word or embarrassed to discuss capitalism in public is a little like doctors who study health and disease being afraid to use the word human body. As teachers and students, we can contribute to creating healthier worlds. What public health skills and competencies are needed to reverse the harm that our political 
and economic systems are imposing? What components of the capitalist system can be modified to improve health? And which will be needed to be transformed in order to reverse our current self-destructive course? Schools of public health can become new centers of forging alternatives to an unhealthy world, but this will require us to question our commitment to the status quo and our sometimes unseemly quest for corporate support. Whatever our roles, we face enormous pressure to focus our attention on the immediate task before us. We react to the student or patient in front of us, the headline in today's paper or broadcast, the tactics we will use to react to the latest political outrage. But those of us who have the privilege of reading and writing and thinking have both the opportunity and the obligation to take a step back from these day-to-day -day frays. We need to be asking deeper questions, questions like, what are the essential characteristics of the political and economic system that has emerged in this world in the early 21st century? How do these defining elements jeopardize the future of human and planetary health? How can health and well being serve as the glue to bring together the many disparate groups now working for transformation? What is our shared vision for the transformative changes that, in the long run, can ensure we leave a healthier world for future generations? Too often, our mainstream institutions accept the self justifying but intellectually bankrupt ideas that corporate America wants us to believe, that there is no alternative to the world of 21st century capitalism, and that transformative change is always quixotic, always doomed to failure. In my view, these beliefs are the biggest obstacle to improvements in human and planetary health. I hope those of you here today, those of you who read this book, will consider what role you can play in challenging these dangerous beliefs that jeopardize our health. I hope you will create up to opportunities for the people and institutions and communities in your lives to examine the ways that our current political and economic system endangers our well being and how we can act to change that system. I hope you'll search for ways to bring together the now mostly separate streams of activism into more powerful rivers of change. And most of all, I hope that together we can nurture the belief that has always throughout human history motivated improvements in health, living conditions, and social justice, the belief that another world is possible. Thank you so much. And Marion, I turn it over to you. Yeah, I, uh, we will have two commentaries by Marion and then Mary. Marion is going to, I think, uh, I'm going to try to show slides. No, no, I, I know you can do it. Uh, I can't. I'm, I'm sorry. It's, no matter how many times I do this, it seems just terribly difficult. Um, let's try that and that and that. You have started your screen sharing. All right. And so how have I, how have I done? Am I on? Brilliant. <laughs> So, so Amon, thank you very much for your lovely introduction. I'm so happy to be part of your family. And Nick, thank you for what feels like an enormous honor to be able to comment on your book. Um, I write books about food politics. Nick's book is about much more than just food. Um, and I want to comment on it from uh, the viewpoint of food issues. I wrote a blurb for Nick's book. Um, and I'll just show you what that is here. Uh, the, uh, I consider it a must read for anybody to understand what's going on, particularly now in the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the difficulties with work, food insecurity, and the environmental problems that are happening, happening. And my blurb said, capitalism may not be the only cause of these problems, but it is certainly something that is common to all of them. And this book is a great place to understand why. 
I too have referred to capitalism as the C word. Um, I, until very recently, I would never mention the word capitalism in my teaching or my lectures because it made people really, really uncomfortable. I think that's changing. Students in my classes are asking about it all the time. Um, it comes up in any discussion of food systems. Food system is the new trendy term for understanding how food works and it, it means everything uh, about food from how it's grown, processed, distributed, obtained, prepared, and how, uh, and how wasted. You have to look at the whole thing at once, linking agriculture to public health. Um, students are asking about it. And of course, the most important public health problems related to diet global food system problems, hunger and food insecurity, obesity and non-communicable diseases, the environmental effects of how we produce and consume food, and now the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic are all closely related to capitalism and much of the difficulties that are occurring with all of these are due to capitalist economic systems. Um, I wrote about this some time ago in articles on big food, food systems and global health, in which um, David Sukler and I talked about the root cause of all of these problems, which are food systems driven to maximize profits. We weren't inventing this. Raj Patel in his book Stuffed and Starved and more recently in the history of the world in seven cheap things, uh, we're talking about this and I now have a fairly extensive collection of books um, on capitalism and the food system, let them eat junk, how capitalism makes people hungry and obese, the foodies guide to capitalism, a terrific book that I wrote the foreword to, the neoliberal diet that talks particularly about the effects of capitalist economic systems on Mexico. And now Nick's book joins this collection. Every single one of these makes it possible to talk about these things much more. I think of the coronavirus pandemic as a failure of capitalism um, and as a food system problem because it illustrated how diet affects the health and the environment. The failures of food systems to feed people adequately, the inequities in economic, social, and, and racial systems in our country, the extraordinary uh, untoward power of food corporations to call the shots in all of this, the politics of hunger. And I think as Nick put it, it sets up an agenda for food advocacy uh, that gives us um, a roadmap for what to do. Jose Andres, the chef who has become a public health hero, uh, talked about the effects of capitalism in one, in one tweet uh, that I made a slide of. Two photos that tell the story of what's gone on during the pandemic. On the one hand, vast amounts of food being destroyed at the same time as miles and miles of cars were lined up to get handouts from food banks. This is capitalism in action in the United States in 2020 at least. We also see the diet, the importance of diet in that diet is related to uh, the caught the, the chronic diseases, the non-communicable diseases that increase the risk for bad outcomes of COVID-19. Hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease are all closely related to dietary intake. Uh, the ultra-processed foods that Nick mentioned um, and that are so profitable and so bad for us. The CDC finds that 78% of people who were hospitalized for COVID were either overweight or obese. That was also true of 
um, intensive care unit admissions and also, and, a, and very close to that percentage for deaths due to COVID. Why aren't we doing something about having people eat more healthfully so they can avoid these problems? These are problems not of personal responsibility or personal choice, but problems that are very closely related to social and behavioral determinants of health, racial and ethnic discrimination, inadequate access to healthy food and health care, the, the bad and polluted neighborhoods that people live in, poverty, lack of education, lack of community cohesiveness are all risk factors for obesity, for chronic diseases, and for severe outcomes from COVID-19. If we want to do something to prevent these conditions, we have to do something to make our society healthier. And th there have been several suggestions for how to go about doing this. I want to mention a report that came out, a commission report that came out uh, in The Lancet in January of 2019, the global syndemic of obesity under nutrition and climate change, in which it, the report looks at the problems of hunger, obesity, and climate change, and talks about what kinds of food system approaches, what kinds of dietary changes we need to make in order to address all three of those problems simultaneously, what they referred to as triple duty approaches. We know what a healthy diet is. It's a diet that contains less meat and more fruits and vegetables, Unfortunately, that diet is not profitable for the food system as it's currently constituted. The barriers uh, that report talked about to doing something about changing people's diets, they referred to as consumptogenic economic system, which I thought was a funny euphemism for capitalism. I guess they didn't want to use that particular C word and they invented another one. Um, and by consumptogenic economic systems, they re were referring to symptoms in to systems in which corporations have all of the economic power in which public goods are privatized, in which corporations do not have to pay the externalized costs of what they produce. Instead, societies pay those costs, and in which governments neglect the risks of allowing that much corporate power to take place. Uh, they identified as the as the inability to do anything about this, what they called policy inertia. Policy inertia was the result of weak governance, govern governments that are essentially captured by corporations, strong food industry opposition to anything that would reduce their profits, and unfortunately, weak civic demand for changing the system. So that's an agenda for adv advocacy. Let's, if we do nothing else, let's strengthen civic demand. And as they put it, a transformative social movement is needed to overcome the policy inertia that they described. So we're talking here about social movements. It's time to have a social movement based on food. Food is a great way to understand understand capitalism, much easier to understand it through food than through many other ways. Um, and the we need what I think we need is very, very strong food system advocacy to try to get people to understand what capitalism is doing to us and to try to change the system. Or as they put during the Occupy Wall Street movement, let's occupy the food system and do it right away. And that's what I want my students to do. And it's why I'm still teaching. Thanks very much for letting me share this with you. Marion, your, your command of Zoom technology, uh, if, if that is a representation of your expertise that we all know, is absolutely riveting. Uh, so now you need to unshare. And our next comment will be uh, from our dear colleague and friend, Mary Bassett from Boston, uh, telling us about her take on this important book. Uh, thanks very much, Ayman, and, and I'm really pleased to be able to join um, with such a, a, a distinguished looking group. I see old friends among the crowd and 
Uh, and to join uh, Nick and, and Marion, uh, Nick talking wonderfully about his book. Uh, Marion, I, I first heard you speak like well over a decade ago and it's still riveting. I, um, I, I wrote out my notes because I, um, I have things I wanna say and, I, and we don't have much time. And I wanna make sure that we have time for discussion. So I will begin by recounting how I first heard Nick use the word capitalism, talk about capitalism. And that was at a meeting in Bangkok, Thailand. It was in early 2019. And this was at a meeting that was uh, co-sponsored by the People's Health Movement, though, although it's a rather elite meeting. Uh, PHM, if you haven't heard of it, is a global network of grassroots health activists, civil society organizations, academic institutions, mainly from developing countries. So I thought Nick was talking about capitalism because he was away from home, he was hanging out with PHM people, and he was getting outspoken. Uh, of course, I should have known better because Nick has always been outspoken wherever he is. And I want to acknowledge CUNY and the school, public school, school of public health that CUNY has for giving him a, a wonderful uh, home in which to thrive. But in fact, what he was doing uh, at this meeting in Bangkok was sharing the thinking that we now have in a book form, the, at what cost modern capitalism and the future of health. And, and I also wanted to mention this meeting so that I can acknowledge Professor David Saunders, uh, whose thinking I, I believe in Flex, the book, he worked with Nick, uh, it, it, it has affected my own work and he died unexpectedly and far too soon later that year. Uh, Carlos Montero, who I saw in the list of names that popped up uh, was also at that meeting. David would be really pleased to see this book, and I am too. Anybody who cares about health, the environment, our food, dignity, and fairness should, should read it. So I want to begin by congratulating Nick on what is a really brave tour de force. In the United States, it, it takes courage to talk about capitalism more than other wealthy nations. The U.S. has kept alive the notion of the so-called communist menace, the lurking socialism, and Nick has been undeterred. Well done. I uh, also have not often used the word capitalism. I come from a family uh, with history um, related to, um, to the kind of brutal suppression of people who were members of the Communist Party. So I guess I'm affected also by that. So it's more like pastime, uh, not just time to extend the conversation about health harming corporate practices, big tobacco, big food, big pharma, big tech, uh, and link these to the social and economic relations that en entrench and enable this behavior, capitalism. The most important message of this book is that capitalism, particularly the rapacious form of US capitalism with which we enter the 21st century is not natural and it must be changed. Our very planet, not to mention the people and the other living things who inhabit it, depend on dismantling a system whose logic is profit and not human well-being. And it's a really sweeping topic. And, and I wanna let those of you who haven't yet looked at the book uh, to, to know that the book really ably breaks it down into manageable parts. It begins with the distinguishing features of modern capitalism, globalization, financialization, market concentration, privatization, deregulation, tax cuts, and austerity. I wasn't familiar with the word financialization, and that refers to the variety of way of packaging and moving around money that now um, is a, a key way of making profit. So Nick, Nick then takes these concepts and shows how they work in the pillars of health that he's already outlined. That's food, which we've heard about ably from Marion. And I agree that it's a great, um, a, a great exemplar. But if that's not it for you, there's education, there's healthcare, there's work, there's transportation, and there's social connections and how we now relate to each other. Uh, the rise of ultra-processed food, the food that you can't make at home because you 
don't have these ingredients in a home kitchen, uh, the emergency of publicly funded, privately managed charter schools, Ubers to skip a subway ride, gadget galore medicine, and reading the book, you will see how all of these trace their logic to the characteristics of capitalism. And each section ends with the optimist that we all know Nick to be with an alternative vision that shows that we can do something differently. We learn about taxi drivers organizing, teachers striking in defense of childhood. And I really learned a lot reading the book. Um, New York City's pioneering trans fat restriction, for example, in 2006, something that I've been really proud about, led eventually to uh, an FDA ban of trans fats um, to take these unhealthy fats out of our food supply. I didn't relate this to the mass massive expansion of palm oil production and its devastating impact uh, or how global trade agreements have forced patent restrictions on poor nations, something that we're seeing playing out now uh, with the access, rather lack of access to the COVID vaccine. And so we see the pattern emerge, private profit before public health, capitalism, especially in its modern predatory form. I've spent, as many of you know, uh, many years thinking about racism in the United States and its impact on health. And here's where I think, although not near summation, Nick, uh, that my, differ, my thinking may differ a bit from what Nick conveys in the book. You quote Ibram Kendi's remark that racism and capitalism are conjoined twins, but in the book, uh, racism joins a whole list of challenges. There's sexism, there are climate crises, and so on. And in contrast, I find racism as foundational to US capitalism. To attribute these inequities that we all know are so long standing simply to US systemic racism of long standing, as the book does, is incomplete and therefore misleading. Fundamentally, enslaved Africans were imported and kept in bondage for their labor. The purpose of racism is not to make Black people miserable. It is to exploit us. And the embrace of white supremacy is what I can find to explain why such a large slice of white working class people have chosen class collaboration over class solidarity. In my view, much of the challenge of tackling capitalism has foundered on the failure to acknowledge the actual history of the United States, a country that began as a settler colony, procured land through genocidal campaigns against the people whom the Europeans found here, enslaved people then worked this land and this profitable blood-stained enterprise catapulted the US into the ranks of wealthy nations and established the brand of capitalism that we have here today. So the usual argument is that poor and working class people have been misled by racism and that this causes them to overlook their own exploitation and instead blame their miseries on black people. And it is the failure to make compelling the fact that racism harms everyone that permits this misunderstanding to persist. And I've heard this rationale for many, many years. I haven't read The Sum of Us, Heather McGee's new book, but I believe more or less she makes this argument again. It's true that the costs of our brand of capitalism are all around us. In 2015, overall life expectancy began to decline, including for some whites, this really should sound alarms. It's a very unusual historic event. The decline will be even greater um, because of COVID. But the US departure from upward uh, trends in life expectancy experienced by other wealthy nations began way back in 1980. So the recent uh, Lancet Commission on Public Policy in the Trump era showed that if we just kept in the middle of the pack, over 450,000 deaths would not have occurred. And, and it goes on as the COVID impact is also showing. So for just how long and for how many generations 
can we attribute white politics to political confusion? The last time the majority of white voters voted for a Democratic for president was in 1964. So Ibram Kendi's image of conjoined twins really tells an important truth in the United States that racism and capitalism share the same heart. So shouldn't we begin to call out the generations of class collaboration that racism has triggered? Shouldn't we accept that this is a choice and not simply a matter of being duped? <laughs> Clearly, it seems to me that whites can choose to change and I, I'm probably really short on time, but I wanna quickly relay my daughter's account of a New Orleans protest following George Floyd's murder. This, a large, as in thousands and thousands of people, a multiracial collection of mostly young people were marching through New Orleans streets and they approached what once had been a sundown parish. The police stood in the street in military type attire and the leaders of the march, mostly young people of color, but not all of them, called out on bullhorns, white people to the front. I won't forget the awe in my daughter's voice when she said, and mom, they went. There have been whites who've died for black rights over many generations, but the, on this past summer, the scale was truly different. And I think that it shows that we ha can have sparks that trigger moments of social mobilization. The book ends, as Marion notes, by talking about social movements as really critical for achieving health for all. And, and this is such an important point and I hope that we will just explore it further in our discussion. So as I wind up, uh, we have to talk about capitalism. And I thank Nick for initiating the dialogue that traces the tentacles of capitalism back to what creates and harms our health. As someone famously wrote, the point is not to explain the world, the point is to change it. And I suggest that we start by invoking capitalism in our explanation of inequities. Just keep asking why this happens and we will come to capitalism. I used to think it was really brave to talk about racism. When I began as health commissioner in New York, making this central to what I talked about, people argued to me that this was off-putting, that even to use the word, you would lose more people than you gain. Well, um, editor, deputy editor, of the of JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, just resigned, having made a similar argument in a podcast. And I think we should see that times change. And now it's still time to be brave, but it's time to be brave and start talking about capitalism. Piketty did it, uh, Kaysen Deaton did it, and now Nick Freudenberg has done it. I'm not sure uh, exactly how we do this, but I have some ideas and I hope that the discussion will get us started because if we care about health, we have to begin. So thank you very much. And I look forward to the conversation. And now I can go back to seeing all of you. Thank you, Mary, so yeah. much. Uh, I must admit that the three presentations emphasize uh, elements of awareness, uh, conscience and consciousness. Um, I'm really uh, looking forward to the conversation. You can write your questions uh, on the chat uh, if you wish, or uh, if you would prefer to raise your hand, but I think writing the question on the chat will be the easiest way for me to monitor since we have uh, almost 250 participants and I won't be able to see you very easily. Uh, so I see a question from Valerie M to everyone. The anti-hunger policy conference that is happening right now is sponsored by Amazon and Walmart. And no one is discussing how capitalism and philanthropy are toxic. Um, hmm, maybe Marion, you'd like to say something about that if you'd unmute yourself. Uh, 
well, I wasn't invited to speak at that conference. I wonder why. <laughs> I didn't even know it was existing. Um, yeah, philanthropic capitalism. There's a lot being written about that. I just want to say, I think that one of the good things that's coming out of the coronavirus pandemic was to bring all this stuff out in the open. Um, people are talking about these issues now in a way that I've never seen them talked about. And certainly in the class that I'm teaching at NYU this semester, the students are just right out there, not only talking about capitalism, but talking about racism in exactly the same way that Mary is talking about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when I see Amazon and Walmart as the um, heads of a conference, as the supporters of a conference on um, hunger, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, because these are the companies that are most profiting off of uh, food insecurity in this country because that's where the dollars from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, formerly food stamps, are spent. Um, they're spent on Amazon and they're spent on Walmart. And these are the companies that are most lobbying for online sales, despite the fact that many SNAP recipients don't have access to Wi-Fi, broadband, or um, computers for that matter. And of course, they're interested in hunger. They're deeply in bed with anti-hunger organizations. Um, and this is, a, in fact, um, Andrew, Andy Fisher has a book called Big Hunger that documents the relationship between big food and the anti-hunger community. Um, so this is, again, another example of capitalism in action. Um, and we have to watch out for it. Who I don't know who asked that question, but thank you. So uh, another thought uh, on on the role of philanthropy. I think in public health, it's sometimes very hard to be critical of uh, of uh, foundations that seem so generous. The Gates Foundation, the Bloomberg Foundation, the Buffett Foundation, and yet those foundations uh, often use their corporate worldview to impose their solutions. And I think we need to become uh, more questioning of their approach. I think the uh, foundations have, uh, of course, played a useful role, uh, particularly as government support has declined in, in, in a paradox. They have justified the austerity measures of cutting public support for, for example, the World Health Organization. Uh, and they've also uh, privileged the technocratic uh, technical solutions that the billionaire foundations propose rather than uh, bottom up uh, people oriented solutions that are more likely to solve the apocalypses that we're facing. We have a very good question from Isaac. Hey, ben. Uh, hey, ben. I'm sorry. Uh, how can young professional academics navigate themselves into a space where they can make a living doing this type of work we are discussing tonight? People need salaries. And outside of great institutions uh, like yours, uh, it is not very easy uh, to find an employer invested uh, in, in such work. So, um, I don't know. Um, Mary, what do you think? What's happening in Harvard? Well, Cornell West just left, so... <laughs> um, so you know, I, 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 I think that... Um, uh, I can only acknowledge the, the fact that the, the corporate world really has uh, made uh, uh, big strides into private universities, including private uh, elite universities. And that is also challenging the role that universities should play in uh, bringing you know, hard questions and difficult conversations in front of people. Uh, so, you know, the question is, how do you make a living? And the answer is that um, 
you know, I, 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 I think that we heard about Raj Chetty's work on, um, on, on um, uh, food and so on, but he's also done all this work on, on, in, on, uh, on economic mobility. And I, I see it in my own children. I, I, I don't really know how to give people career advice. I can only say what I've done which is to work on what I'm passionate about. And clearly I remained employed. So I, you know, I, I think that um, you can't take the position that you're not gonna engage with capitalism if you live in the United States. Every time you walk out the door, you're participating in a capitalist economy. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that as a reason not to work at a university. Yeah, or I would say, Isaac, somebody in your shoes uh, would do very well by contacting Nick Freudenberg and having a direct conversation with him about your career and about where you want to go with your career. There are many young people that are now defying the culture of the static culture of academe. And I hope that Nick can perhaps give you some ideas and uh, maybe you can, uh, you can use him as a mentor. Uh, Sherry Jardin just asked, Dr. Freudenberg, I'm interested in hearing your responses to the speakers, particularly Dr. Bassett's remarks on the inextricable link between capitalism and racism. What can we as practitioners, activists, researchers do that is real and impactful to uncouple and or dismantle exploitative capitalism and racism. To you, dear Nick. Shari, thank you so much for your question. shari has been a student in my last two classes, uh, exactly the kind of uh, person who comes to CUNY to become a public health researcher and a social justice activist. Uh, so uh, I agree with the notion that uh, the systems of racism and capitalism are inextricably linked in US history and that we have to do uh, a better job of understanding how to turn into practice uh, the creation of a movement that will no longer accept the divides that Mary described. And Mary, thank you so much for bringing this really critical question uh, onto this agenda and so many other agendas as you've done. I think uh, in our Food Policy Institute, we are uh, spending a lot of time trying to understand how to put uh, dismantling systemic racism in the food system in New York and the nation at the center of the work we do. And I think it's, we're working this out in practice. Uh, I think it means looking for the shared interests. I, I think the, uh, the strategies combine uh, asking and expecting white people to step forward as, as Mary uh, gave from that beautiful example of the demonstration in New Orleans, was it? Uh, and they also require uh, uh, building on Heather McGee's insights, which I think are more, it's, it's understanding the connections between what white people gain by buying into racism and what they lose and what the planet loses. I think we're not very good at talking about that calculus and, uh, getting people to re-question what they gain and what they lose. And I would welcome uh, Mary and others' thoughts on what are some concrete ways within public health that we're beginning to do that. You've been writing about that a bunch, Mary, and it's been uh, so helpful. And I, I wonder if you have some practical strategies to suggest to people who are listening of how we can do that. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what, what practical really means. If we, I think that we have to apply a, a, an anti-racist lens to all that we do. And that if we trace back uh, many of the calamities that we're confronting, we'll find racism and capitalism. 
So I fundamentally believe that we, uh, that we have to make fighting racism part of fighting capitalism and vice versa. Um, I, I do, um, I, you know, I, I'm troubled by, um, by the, the longstanding kind of view that, that white people um, somehow are misled that they're benefiting from this because I just don't see how that could be true. I don't think people are, particularly white working class people, that people, I don't think people are stupid. Um, and of course, the black electorate has never shared this, uh, this confusion. Um, so I, I do think that we just have to confront racism. I, I really think that that's part of seeing our way to a successful anti-capitalist uh, agenda. And, and of course, you know, capitalism doesn't have to be as predatory as our current system is, that all of Western Europe is, are, these are, you know, countries with national health insurance or national health systems are, are upstanding capitalist countries. The U.S. is an outlier and just bringing us back from outlier status would be progress. Yeah, I, uh, forgive me for, for uh, interceding, but I would say that Again, you have again. <laughs> we need to we need to demonstrate actual models of success where uh, racial equity and uh, and economic equity, uh, you know, support each other. And th there are great possibilities, uh, even within our own country, to think of models where people can actually see this work working well and and working successfully. So. Uh, maybe well, yeah. maybe we can include entrepreneurs, social activists uh, in that in that domain. We have a question from Anna. Can I just add? I, I, I want to give you a practical example. Uh, school integration, um, for example, in a book called *Children of the Dream*, um, uh, uh, he tracked um, the experience of children who went to integrated schools. Now, decades on. And the, uh, the, everybody benefited uh, so that the academic, uh, uh, and they benefited from it being an integrated classroom. Um, and the academic attainment of black children went up and of white children re, you know, was un, undamaged. So I, people need to hear more that these that these have um, you know that, that that we've had these successes as you say. Um. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Uh, Anna Levi, can you talk about disaster capitalism at this moment in time when global food insecurity projections are expected to spike due to supply chain chaos, etc., and the wide range of corporate actors that are weighing in or actively shaping relief, recovery, and stabilizing efforts. Where should we be paying most attention? That is uh, national, public, private, WTOs, partnerships, et cetera. Nick, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, disaster capitalism uh, is the concept that capitalists use disasters to uh, advance their agenda. Naomi Klein has uh, written about this. Uh, and it's something we see in every crisis and we also see it in uh, COVID. Uh, and in the case of food insecurity, uh, you know, the uh, 30 to 40% increase in food insecurity in New York City after the uh, pandemic is uh, a real example of that. I think around food insecurity, I've learned a lot from my, uh, colleague Jan Papendiek, which is to question the charitable instinct. And I think if you look at the role of uh, big food in responding to food insecurity, their responses are almost always charitable, donating food, you know. Uh, and that is not a long-term or sustainable solution. Uh, food insecurity doesn't come from not having enough food. It comes from inequitably distributing power and income and wealth. 
and in disasters, as well as compare the United States and Europe, the uh, more uh, benevolent capitalist countries that Mary uh, talked about. In, in Europe, when people lost their jobs as a result of COVID, their income was immediately replaced and they didn't have to worry about food insecurity because the notion was in a wealthy country, that's a social good, that having food was a right. In this country, we uh, many people lost their income. Some, but not all, got a replaced by federal relief and these federal relief programs are an opening for change, but many people lost their income. And so rather than uh, donating food you know, at the local food pantry, what the, these employers should have done is to continue to pay their, their employees. And many of the uh, organizations who laid people off, in fact, profited during the pandemic. It's a clear case of using a disaster to increase their share of returns at the expense of their workers. Yeah. Our, our technical support uh, has brought to my attention a series of questions uh, from Jovino, Robert Reich, arguing that we should fix capitalism for the many, not the few. Is that the answer? Uh, or something more along the lines of uh, democratic socialism or something else like that? Or is it really too soon to conclude anything so large and so radical, I guess. What do you think, Nick? So in my view- At the heart of your book, really. <laughs> right. I think that uh, we get sidetracked by debating vociferously what brand of capitalism or socialism uh, is the best you know, at this moment in 2021. I think we have so much work to do before we're ready to discuss that question. We need to uh, address, you know, what, what Mary called the predatory aspects of our current form of capitalism, what in the book I call toxic capitalism, uh, that has so worsened just in the last 20 years. And we need to begin to look for the paths where incremental changes can lead to transformative changes, where we can begin for the uh, social movements to uh, win victories that take them to more transformative victories. And the uh, road to a new economic form uh, will be made, and I, I have the quote in the book, that's a road we make by walking it you know, that will we'll forge the answers in practice. And so much of the history uh, of the left, the less effective history of the left has been in uh, debating between different factions rather than uh, developing a practice, improving it and bringing about changes. So that's how I respond to that question. And I wonder if Marion or Mary have- yeah. We have a lot of questions, I must admit that Mohit, if we can record these questions and, and then maybe our panelists can- uh, Yes, I'm happy to reply later. over the next but few days. An interesting question here that's very, very much related to the here and now. Uh, Irma Hidayana in Indonesia, she said, currently private sector employees are allowed to be inoculated against COVID while not all health workers, frontliners and elderly are being vaccinated. We have a problem of vaccine equity uh, and, and social justice. Access to vaccination partly defined by affiliation to private sector organizations. Uh, Mary, what do you think? Nick, this is what we, that's what we fear. Uh, I, mean, but what I, are your that. On that? I guess it sounds like the private employers are getting vaccines for their workers or at least some of their workers. Yeah. So, but there's, you know, we have enormous inequities now in who's getting vaccinated and who's not. Um, in the U.S., those are typically most available, and even this is incomplete by racial ethnic group. Uh, we don't have it by occupation or by uh, measures of, of income or uh, socioeconomic status, but those would be inequitable as well, I expect. But the inequities between nations are the are far greater uh, because the um, you know the 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 this these vaccines are are not even going to be available in Africa, for example, until well well into 2022. 
So uh, this is something that the head of the World Health Organization has spoken about very eloquently. It's a moral challenge, but it's not only that, you know, we all know by now that a virus can move very quickly and that we won't be, quote, safe um, while we're leaving, um, you know, uh, transmission ongoing in other parts of the world. So I, you know, I, I think that this is why that, that we should all educate ourselves about these di discussions about patent rights, uh, about the licensing of vaccine production to other developers, uh, about the arguments that developing countries are making that they should have the right to this vaccine, which is privately owned, but was publicly funded. Yeah. The, uh, I'm, I'm privileged to read all the comments on, on the chat side and they're so interesting, but unfortunately we seem to be running out of time. So I will pose a last question to our author uh, and, and it is related to unions. And it, uh, Steffi Wallhandler is saying, seems like the union movement is one place where black and white cooperation has sometimes paid off for everyone. Would you like to make a brief comment on that, Nick, since that is of historic importance? And then, unfortunately, we have to more or less close the discussion. Yes, I, I think there are some very promising uh, multiracial alliances around worker organizing. Organizing workers at Amazon, there are currently big fights in many parts of the country to organize workers uh, largely low wage workers. Uh, also in the food sector, uh, I think there are important initiatives. Uh, through my Food Policy Institute, we've been working some with uh, the unions that are organizing fast food workers here in New York City, uh, a, a, a workforce that is uh, people of color, uh, young people, women, uh, and uh, suffering from uh, really dangerous working conditions, low wage, no benefits. In New York City, uh, in the last few years, we've passed several new laws, a new minimum wage law, uh, a fair schedules law saying that you can't fire people because they don't want to work a different schedule, a paid sick leave. This set of things, I think they illustrate uh, the principle Mary was talking about, they benefit all workers. Uh, and they also uh, address the intersectional uh, needs of uh, workers of color, women workers, and so on. And I think we need to be looking for policies. We need to be looking for jurisdictions where the labor movement has enough power to be able to win these victories. And then, like uh, we did with uh, trans fat, take those uh, policy advances uh, around the states and then around the country. And we now have uh, some opportunities to make that case with the, uh, the Biden administration. And I often recall uh, the perhaps apocryphal story when a bunch of the reformers who had uh, helped uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt win his first election uh, and they came to say, well, what are you gonna do for us? And he said, well, what are you gonna make me do? And I think that's the question that we all need to be asking. What are we gonna make the Biden administration do? What are we gonna make the Senate do? And that will be the social movements together that we're able to launch in the coming years. And I look forward to seeing you on the picket line in the library uh, and on Zoom, I'm afraid, for at least a few more months. I wanted to uh, thank all of you for coming today. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you, Mary, and thank all of you, uh, my dear friends, colleagues, I hope some of you readers as well, uh, for joining this event. Thank you, Nick, and this has been one of the best attended uh, seminars we've had at the school recently, so we thank you all for uh, joining us in celebrating this important publication, and I hope you'll get copies of the book and uh, we will preserve the chat and communicate it to Nick, uh, to my colleagues at the CUNY School of Public Health. Uh, my apologies that I, uh, I know that you can reach out to Nick directly with your questions. So I did not prioritize uh, your questions, but those of the audience 
Uh, but on the other hand, I am truly, truly excited that we launch our celebration for our fifth anniversary with such an important, informative event. Uh, Nick, you're a trailblazer. Uh, Mary, uh, uh, Marion, uh, and Nick are a formidable force that is a force for change. And we are very proud to call them in different intersections. Uh, uh, friends of the CUNY uh, Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policies and allies of the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. Thank you all for attending today and we hope to see you at the other two events that are coming up very soon. Thank you all for participating. Congratulations, Nick. Thank you, Ayman. How do I, I want to do